Perfect. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Hopefully we are uh, going to get a few people to start viewing here quickly. And uh, while we do that, maybe I'll just introduce myself. My name is Lance Egan. I am an Umpqua Feather Merchants fly designer, signature fly designer. Uh, I love to fly fish. Uh, if you haven't checked out some of my patterns, I encourage you to do so. Quick Google search will bring up most of those. Uh, today's uh, focus is going to be dry flies. So we're going to talk a lot about dry flies, a lot about dry fly fishing, hopefully get through some of your questions. Uh, we're going to watch some videos from some skilled tires. Uh, don't worry, you only have to worry about one of my videos. The rest of them are going to be much, much better. So we're going to have some cool flies to check out. Uh, hopefully we can interact a little bit before and after those those tying videos and uh, get through lots and lots of questions. That'd be a good time. Uh, to get started, I want to first thank Umqua for the opportunity uh, to do this on behalf of all the tires, uh, not only just in this particular session, but in all the sessions. Uh, it's really cool for us to be able to interact with uh, our fellow fly fishers and share our passion and share our flies with all of you. So thanks Umqua for that. And also uh, I want to throw a shout out to Trout Unlimited for supporting and promoting these tying sessions. If you're not already a member of TU, uh, I highly encourage you to become a member. They do a lot of good things for the fishing community and for uh, conservation and, and that sort of thing. So jump on TU's website and uh, become a member if you're not already. Um, also as a heads up, these sessions, uh, this is the third season I believe. And as you know, I mentioned, we're doing dry flies today, but these sessions with Umqua go for the next four months. So I think there's sessions on dries, obviously. There, there's one on nymphs that's already up on YouTube. We're gonna have some on streamers, some with uh, saltwater flies, one with what they call junk flies. Uh, I don't believe in junk flies, there's no such thing. All flies are flies. But anyway, junk flies, uh, competition flies, I think is another one. Anyway, lots of opportunities to see some tires and interact with some of the Umqua uh, fly designers with their particular patterns. So keep an eye out. Uh, they'll be on YouTube if you can't catch them live, but they'll be on live, uh, on YouTube live. So, you know, check those out if you get a chance. Uh, also, as a side note, don't forget to subscribe and, uh, and like also, like the videos on YouTube. That way you can get notifications of when there's a new video that's posted. You'll, uh, then you can watch it on your time. So liking and subscribing goes a long way. So please do that if you get a chance. You can do it now. You can do it at the end. However you want to do it, just like and subscribe, pretty please. Otherwise, uh, if you're really bored, uh, a little self shameless self-promotion, don't forget to check out my social media accounts, at Lance Egan Fly Fishing on Instagram. And then I also do a little bit just under my name, Lance Egan, on Facebook. Uh, Otherwise, I want to just jump right into some of these dry flies. Hopefully we get a few questions. So if you have questions along the way or if you have a question to start us off, please send it through. I think they're taking questions uh, both on Instagram and on YouTube here. So uh, I probably won't be able to see or get all of your questions. But if you have a particular question, please send it over and uh, we'll do our best to get as many answered as possible. All right. So on tonight's show, we have Quite a lineup actually we have some really really cool tires we have mike mercer uh he's well known for lots and lots of his patterns at umqua we have phil iwani we have josh smitherman and josh grafham also showing one of his favorite flies uh, and then i'll be uh doing one of them as well i'll be doing my corn fed caddis so we're gonna have mike do the missing link phil's gonna do the iwani done Smitherman, his new pint caddis, that's a brand new fly you probably haven't seen because it's new from Umqua for 2022, I believe. Um, Josh Graffin is going to demonstrate the stubby chubby and I will do the corn fed caddis. Um, so before we get to the videos, I wanted to talk a little bit about just dry fly fishing, what it is, why I like it. Uh, I think most of you that are watching this probably have a, a really good idea of what dry fly fishing is. It's something that, uh, oddly enough, I'm not very well known for. It's something that I spend a lot of time doing, but I'm known more for nymph fishing. And uh, even though I spend the majority of my summer fishing dry flies, uh, everybody seems to think that the only thing I ever do is nymph fish. So I guess I gotta, I gotta work on my perception here. But anyway, uh, I love dry fly fishing. I love the visual aspect of it. I love watching fish rise to the surface, take a dry off the surface. 
Uh, I love watching, you know, it's a very visual experience. I love watching the fish, sometimes sight fishing to rising fish, sometimes just covering water. Uh, either way, it's a lot of fun. But watching the fish come up and inspect your offering, and hopefully with a good presentation and a good uh, you know, quality fly, good imitation, or a good attractor, you, you get a good take. Um, it's really fun just to, to interact with the fish and watch them uh, see your fly. Again, that visual aspect is, is tops to me. There isn't much else that's better than dry fly fishing. Um, another reason I really like dry fly fishing personally is casting. I really like fly casting. It's something I've spent a lot of time doing, and uh, it's something that's very, very fun and very, uh, you know, I guess basic to be honest, but it's it's something that uh, if if you're not very good at fly casting, dry fly fishing can be a little bit challenging because to do dry fly fishing really well requires some line control, some accuracy. It requires uh, in you know higher end presentations. It requires aerial mends, uh, a little bit of understanding of, of stream positioning and so on. And and I love to cast the fly rod. So uh, dry fly fishing is, I think, the purest way of enjoying a fly rod with flies. And that's not to take away from nymphing or streamers. Those are very effective techniques that I also love to do. But when you're throwing weighted stuff, whether it's a sinking line or even a weighted streamer, a nymph rig, be it a Euro rig or an indicator rig with some weighted flies or weights on there, it's not quite as uh, clean, let's call it, casting wise. So it's just not, a, it's not my absolute favorite way to fish. Dry flies are my favorite way to fish. So um, those are some of the reasons I like dries. I guess if I were adding one more, one more thing I would say is I love you know having the opportunity to match the hatch. Uh, it's cool to see insects hatching from the river or the lake in whichever case, and knowing a little bit about them, studying them, learning about the insects, and then creating patterns and or using patterns to imitate you know pretty precisely what the fish are feeding on. That's a really fun way to fish using an imitative fly. It's also a lot of fun to just throw attractor patterns to fish that aren't even rising. I don't care how you catch them. If you catch them on dries, that's tops to me. Uh, I want to throw out there, why, why do you guys, why does everybody else like dry fly fishing? Anybody have any comments as to why they like dries? And or do you have any questions about dry fly fishing? Um, w while we get some of the uh, questions that come through, I want to maybe talk about uh, some of the things that I think are important with dry fly fishing, things like um, leader length, tippet size, that kind of stuff. I, to me, uh, one of the most common mistakes I see with most people trying to fish dries is fishing leaders that are much too short. So I would encourage you to fish as long of a leader as you can. You know, that's relative. You don't need a 15 foot leader with a giant hopper or something that's very wind resistant. You might want something that's more compact leader-wise, but when you're trying to make delicate presentations with uh, very, very small flies, you'll get a lot more opportunities at fish by having a long, soft presentation leader. So as long as you can stand, and your casting ability plays in here, if you're a really good caster, you'll have no problem throwing a 15 or longer foot leader. Versus if you're pretty new or you're maybe a little more limited casting-wise, you might be more comfortable with a 8 or 9 or 10 foot leader. Um, either way, a longer leader uh, allows less fly line to be on the water. It, it lessens the impact of the line and leader. It separates the impact of the line from the fly. Those are all good things when you're trying to make a nice, delicate presentation. On the flip side, if you're throwing a big hopper and you're tossing it into the wind, it's got a lot of mass, it's got a lot of wind resistance, and you need a shorter, more powerful leader to turn it over. And sometimes it's helpful... Uh, to have that, that leader actually on a hopper actually hit the water hard to make a nice splat. Uh, there are some situations where fish will react to that plop of the fly. Uh, let's see. So we've got a good question here. It says, Lance Felix here and foremost says, thank you for the tutorials to, you have put out there and caught plenty with your patterns. What are the best flies? So that's a good question, Felix. The best flies are relative to where you live. Um, for the Provo in the winter time, it says, Provo in the winter, the Provo is one of our local tailwaters here in Utah. That's where I live. Uh, the Provo, the best flies in winter would be Midge Patterns, uh, Griffiths Gnats, uh, Morgan's Midge, what else? Things like, um, you know, any sort of Midge Pattern, a little Sprout Midge, or I'm trying to think of others. The Antonio's uh, Quill Bodied Midge with the CDC Wing is a really good one. There are tons of small patterns. 
mostly uh, with midges, it has more to do with having them very small, small options and in a couple of colors and then fishing them on really light tippet. So usually 5X is kind of considered cord for that, usually six, six and a half, seven X tippets. Again, long leader presentations get you a little bit of a softer lay down and hopefully a long leader with lots of tippet that will give you a little longer drag free drift. That's a good question though. All right, we got another one. What's your method for selecting the type of dries you're going to use on the water, i.e. high riding dries versus low riding dries? Uh, my method there would be a little bit to do with am I looking to be more imitative or be a little more attractor? So more attractor, usually riding relatively high, um, larger profile, sometimes brighter colors versus a low riding dry. A lot, for me, a lot of times is more of a uh, emerger stage. Uh, cripple type fly, and a, a mayfly emerger, or a midge emerger, midge pupa, something like that that might have half of its abdomen still stuck in the surface. That would uh, warrant a low riding dry fly. High riding dries, a lot of times caddis flies for me fish better when they're riding really, really high. Uh, stone flies tend to sit relatively low. Hoppers tend to sit relatively low. Mayflies actually ride relatively high when they're in full adults. They they rest kind of on their legs and a little bit of their body for the most part, so they don't have a large impression there on the water. Um, what observations do you do before starting to fish? That's another good question. Um, well, lots, I guess. Sometimes I have a particular technique in mind that I don't really care what else is going on. Sometimes I just want to go fish dries. And so, you know, I have to be a little bit, I have to care a little bit about what might be hatching, what the fish might be looking for. But there are certainly times where uh, I just have a technique in mind, be it streamers, be it nymphing, be it dries, that I just want to focus on. If I'm not doing that, if I'm just going to the river and I'm pretty open to whatever the river is going to throw at me, then I would look at what's hatching, especially if they're dry fly specific, see what's hatching. If there isn't anything hatching, then I would lean on uh, terrestrial patterns or attractors. So one of my go-tos is the bionic ant a lot of the summertime. When there's nothing else going on, just fishing a foam ant that's usually in about a size 12 or so is my go-to to start. Uh, if, if there's hatches going on, then I'm going to get a bit more imitative. Um, there's lots and lots of questions coming in, but let's, be, before I just talk your ear off, let's get to the first pattern here. This is my fly called the corn-fed caddis. The corn-fed is, uh, it's a CDC pattern that is really buggy. It floats really, really well. Uh, it looks kind of like a hot mess. It's, it's, I don't know how to describe it. You'll see it in the video here. It's really, really buggy. You got CDC coming out of every angle. Um, it's a little bit of a departure from typical CDC flies. And I would argue most CDC patterns are very, very sparse. And the corn fed is not sparse. That's why I call it the corn fed caddis. It's a beefy bug. Uh, again, floats really, really well. Has a great silhouette. Uh, I use it by itself as a single dry. I also use it on a dry dropper rig with relatively light droppers. And one of my favorite ways to fish it is to fish it on a long Euro leader with a tungsten dropper and fish the, the corn fed caddis on a dropper tag up above the nymph and actually high stick and twitch the fly across riffles and pockets and things like that. If you've seen, ever experienced a caddis hatch, you've no doubt seen uh, caddis bouncing on the water as they oviposit and drop their eggs. So that's a really fun way to elicit kind of, uh, you know, splashy, aggressive strikes on a caddis pattern. So let's cut to the corn fed caddis here. I'm going to bore you with uh, showing you how to tie that one. And then when we come back, we can answer any questions you might have on that corn fed caddis. Hello fellow fly tires, this is Lance from Fly Fish Food and I want to share with you one of my absolute favorite caddis dry flies. Uh, I'm probably better known for nymphs but uh, this caddis pattern for me has produced a lot of fish across the world. So this one is the uh, corn fed caddis. Uh, corn fed in that I use CDC for this pattern but uh, CDC patterns, uh, let's say traditionally, are a bit more on the sparse side. This one's going to use a lot of CDC, so it's kind of a, a bulky corn-fed, if you will, corn-fed caddis. So it's a little heftier use of CDC, and I hope you like it. I know you'll fish well. So I'm starting with a TMCO 100 hook in the vise. We've got a 14 here. 
you can tie these in lots of colors. I'm going to tie it in a tan size, or sorry, tan color today. You could also do it in an olive or a gray or anything to match whatever caddis body you'd like. I've got some MFC thread here in uh, light brown, and this one is 6 aught for this size. You could use some thinner stuff if you want to do smaller sizes, but for the 14, this is about right. So I'm going to just start the thread here, work to the bend of the hook, get rid of that thread. Next, I'm going to tie in a trailing shuck, which is um, some PMD shuck color of Antron yarn from Wapsi. And it doesn't take very much of this. I oftentimes use about half of the strand. It kind of, on the card, it comes a full strand, and I just split the strand in half to make a little bit more sparse shuck here. I'm going to tie it in. Because it's a synthetic, it's kind of nice because you don't have to worry about how long it is in the back because I can come back and trim it. I'll wrap it forward about two thirds of the hook shank and I'll come back here and trim it to maybe oh, one half of the hook shank. Okay, now I'm going to make a thread wrap uh, that's going to be some ribbing. So I took a loop of thread in my fingers and I'm going to capture it with the thread and then cut one side of it off, doesn't really matter which side, and tie back along the shank. This is going to be my ribbing. So rather than tying a separate material in, or and you could use something like wire, but uh, on dry flies, I, I try not to do anything extra weighty if I don't have to. So then we're going to add the body. Again, you can tie this in lots of colors. This is super fine and tan. Again, you could do it in olive or gray or gray olive or any color you like. So just some tan, super fine. Super fine is great because it dubs really easy and it makes a very, very thin dubbing noodle. So it won't take very much of this. Like always, dubbing less is more. I'm going to dub it and then slide it down to the shank and then start covering my body. And You can build a little bit of a taper if you like, or you can just leave it nice and flat. I don't think that the fish care either way. The naturals will have a little bit of a taper to them. I didn't quite put enough on, so I'm adding a bit more here. See if I can build a little tiny bit of a taper there at the end. Okay, so we've built the body. Then I'm just going to hang this on the bobbin cradle, catch it on the eye, and I'm going to wrap the thread now the opposite direction I wrap the dubbing. So it's counter wrapping it, it's adding durability, and it actually makes a little bit of a segmented look. You can see that wrap through there. And then I'll just capture it with the thread and get rid of the thread ribbing. Okay, next up is the CDC. This is natural CDC, just natural done. Uh, again, you could vary the colors here, but natural done is what I do on almost all of mine. And I've got four uh, feathers of CDC here. I'm going to use the natural tips. I want to get them relatively even, so I'm going to take just a second here and try and pull the tips down so that most of the feather tips are about the same length. They don't have to be exact. A caddis wing will be a little bit rough. Not going to be your super clean cut, but is uh, as close as possible. That's pretty good. Then I'm going to tie those in over the shank, and I want them to be to terminate just barely shy of the shuck, so a little bit beyond the dubbing, maybe halfway through the shuck. So I've got them uh, measured there, and I'll tie them on with the thread. This thread's nice for this because you can apply a fair bit of pressure and it doesn't have a lot of bulk, a lot of buildup. So they're anchored in there pretty well, as you can see. I can pull them around bending the hook. They're not going to go anywhere. Then I'm going to go in and trim those away. Maybe clean up the butts just a little. All right. And then next up, we're going to add a little bit of poly wing, parapost wing. So this is just parapost in white. Uh, this is for visibility, and it probably adds a little bit of flotation too. On this, just like the, the trailing shuck, I like to separate the fiber to maybe a half or at least two thirds, mostly for tie-in bulk. And I'm just gonna tie it in over the top and capture it with the thread and then fold it back so that I don't have the butts to deal with. This will help build a little bit of a nice taper as well on the head and it's anchored in, so it's not going to go anywhere. If you tie it in and just trim it, you have to really latch down on the thread to make sure it doesn't come loose, and that will work, but usually when I do that and come in and trim the butts, it leaves much more bulk here on the head, so this just eliminates some of that bulk. 
Then I'll come back through here, separate my CDC, and I like to trim this a little shorter than the CDC. That's just for me to see more so than the fish. So then we've got our wing on top, makes it nice and visible for us. And now to the slightly trickier part. Not too tricky, but a little bit. I've got a Stonfo dubbing tr twister here. This is my favorite dubbing twister. I'm going to create a, a loop. And we're basically just going to make a CDC hackle here. I've wrapped the bobbin around the thread twice to capture it together so it, it terminates right at the hook um, without having a gap there. So if, if I can flip this around, if I open it, I can get it untwisted anyway. See if you can like make so you can see that. Yeah, it terminates right at the hook without a big gap there. Then once we've got this uh, this dubbing twirler here, this when I pull down on the on the two arms, when these arms get pulled together, it when I pull down on the tool, it pulls the thread together like this, and when I let it go, it separates it. So I'm going to get these back in my thread here so you can see what I mean. Let's see if open up and then close it back down. So what I'm going to do next is use either a Stonfo clip or a Petagene tool if you have one of those and create a CDC loop. So I've got a couple of large CDC feathers here. They're side by side. I'm going to stroke the fibers down. Then I'm going to grab hold of them with a clip tool like that. I don't know if you can tell what's going on there. I've got the stem here and the tool next to it that's clear so it's a little bit hard to see. I'm going to trim the fibers away from the stem and it's going to leave me just the fibers sticking out of the tool. Can you see those right there? Then what I'm going to do is get inside the little triangle that's made by this dubbing loop and because of the pressure, the tension that I can create with this Stonfo dubbing tool, I can stick the clip in here at the bottom where it's open, slide it up to the top, and then pull down on the dubbing tool so it pinches all that CDC in place, and then release the tool, and now I have all of those CDC fibers stuck in the thread. Now I can give them a spin and create a nice little rope and a little hackle, if you will, of CDC. If it gets a little unruly, you can usually get a little brush or a little comb, or I oftentimes even just use Velcro like this, just a little Velcro, and tease it out. And then it makes a nice little hackle of CDC. Next up, and really I should have done this a second ago, but we can still make it work. I'm going to add a little bit of dubbing to the thread just to make it so that this thread loop has something to stick to when I go to wrap it around. And then we can take this CDC dubbing and wrap it around the shank. This is going to get really buggy, but that's okay. You want this fly really buggy. Wrapping around until we get right up to the eye. Like that. And then I'm just going to capture the remainder of the thread dubbing loop or CDC hackle loop with the tying thread, trim it off, and then we've got a really buggy caddis fly. At this point I usually just whip finish, pull some of those fibers back with my fingers, try and make a relatively clean head, give it a pull on the thread, and we're, we're done. We can go back if you want and you can really clean this up again with the Velcro or a dubbing brush and if these really long fibers bother you you can cut them off or trim them down I oftentimes leave them in place. I don't find that it bothers the fish at all And I think they capture a little bit of air and they trap the fly in the surface That's the corn fed caddis really buggy. It will sit pretty low because the CDC is nice and soft It's not as stiff as hackle. So it's a nice kind of emerging type pattern Although I fish it as a dry a lot and even skate it and twitch it um, give that one a try. I think you'll find that's really effective even for super selective trout. All right. So that was the corn fed caddis. Uh, hopefully you saw some of the cool 
features of that fly. It's, uh, as you saw, pretty buggy, but that CDC hackle, it floats really well. It does require some CDC friendly floatants, things like Timco Dry Magic, uh, Shimazaki Dry Shake, some of my absolute favorites for that fly. Uh, I would recommend greasing up your leader as well, putting floatant, uh, thicker floatant, a uh, paste style floatant on your leader from the fly line down, and then maybe leaving oh, 20 to 25, maybe 30 inches of tippet without it, right near the fly, without the floatant. That will keep your leader high and dry, make it easier to lift off, and won't pull your fly under. When you go to, to pick a cast up, and it gets rid of that plopping noise that, that uh, cause it when it's caused when your fly gets pulled under the water when you're pulling it back in for the next cast. All right, so while we were doing that, we had a few questions come in. Um, let's see, so I want to hit some of those. One says, uh, just a dry fly question, what size weight bead do you use your corn fed caddis with? So what will it support, in other words? And that's a good question. It's, it varies a lot depending on how big the corn fed is. So I tend to fish corn fed caddis between about sizes 12 and 16 most commonly, occasionally 18s and occasionally even 10s. Uh, you know, when I want to hold up a, a bigger bead, then a size 10 or 12 is the way to go. If it's going to hold up a little, you know, two and a half mil or a, or even a two mil, then a 16 or so can do that. If you're in the 12, 14 range, it'll hold up usually a three mil bead pretty well, um, especially if the fly is fresh and dry. Um, what else? This one, this question says, you once said on the Fly Fish Food podcast, you talked about how you don't like fishing two dry flies. That's true. That's not a hard, fast rule. I wouldn't say I never do. Uh, in lakes, I oftentimes actually fish three flies. But on rivers, I don't tend to like to fish two dries. I find that two dries tend to one lands in slightly different current than the other, and they tend to tow each other around a little bit, and either one gets a really good dead drift. And then when you want to cast tight to banks and things, two flies is just harder to do that with than a single fly. Again, there's no, just like all things in fly fishing, there are no concrete, this is the only way to ever do it type of rules. you got to adapt to situations. But uh, generally speaking, I don't like fishing two dry flies on rivers. Uh, there are always exceptions to that rule. Uh, what else? So here's one. Even if you're fishing a really small dry fly, you said you'd rather build a cider into your leader. Uh, I'm not sure what that one's regarding. I don't necessarily like to have a cider in my leader. If I'm fishing only dries, I don't have a cider in my leader. Uh, if I were fishing a Euro rig that happened to have a cider and then I needed to fish dries for a second, then I would leave the cider in place. But if I'm just dry fly fishing, I don't use a cider at all. Um, Next question is, do you use tapered leaders or do you like building your own leaders like I do with Euronymphing? And that's also a question that there's no right or wrong answer to. I do both. Uh, when I want to, like if I'm fishing from a drift boat on a big river and I want to pound a big hopper or something in, I'm going to grab an Umqua power taper, you know, like a seven and a half to nine foot, maybe two or three X and just tie right to that tapered leader. On the flip side, my longest, most delicate dry fly leaders, when I'm fishing uh, you know, 15, 18, 20 foot leader, I'm building those because nobody makes a leader long enough uh, that I've ever found anyway, that is really, really good for that particular purpose. There are some pretty good long, let's say 10, 11, 12, even 14 foot leaders out there and they're pretty good. But when I want to get longer than 14 feet, I build my own leaders, but I don't do that for everything. Um, that's more uh, really specific throwing mostly small dries you know, hatch type situations, slow moving water where I don't want to scare fish. I want to have a long distance between my fly and the impact of my line. And I want to have a long, long tippet so that my fly gets a uh, very good drag free drift. All right. Um, what else? Uh, can I talk about skating it, please? Sure. So the corn fed caddis, and really you can do this with any caddis, but the corn fed's great. And one thing, actually, before we talk about skating, I want to talk to you about it with the corn fed. So one of the cool features of CDC is that it's buoyant, but it's not stiff. I mentioned that at the end of the tying video, but it's something I want to elaborate on a little bit. You'll find that fish get a CDC fly in their mouth easier than a really stiff fibered fly. So if you put a really good quality genetic hackle surrounding the, the eye of the fly or a stiff elk hair or deer hair wing, not that fish can't eat those. We've all caught lots of fish on an elk hair caddis. But uh, fish that are just sipping a fly will get a CDC soft pattern in their mouth farther and easier. So they're easier to hook on a fly that's less stiff. Uh, so that's one more feature of that corn fed. 
uh, skating it. There's lots of things you can do. I would describe it less as skating and more as uh, almost twitching it. So on a long Euro system, this is my favorite way to do it. You can skate it just on a regular uh, tapered leader type outfit. But my favorite way to do it is taking a Euro setup with a super long rod, 10 to 11 foot rod, uh, super long leader, usually 20 foot leader or so. And I have my dry fly on the top tag on my dropper and a nymph on the point. So at the terminal end of my leader. And you cast it usually across or down and across, and you high stick like you often do with Euro nymphing, and you just basically shake the rod a little bit through the drift to make that dry fly. You're anchored anchored in with the dropper, and uh, your dry fly is just bouncing on the surface, so it lifts and drops and lifts and drops. You could find uh, there's a, there's some some footage of it on our uh, modern nymphing elevated video, and also I believe on our adaptive fly fishing instructional videos that are on Vimeo. Um, or there's a little bit of it on Fly Fish Rig's YouTube channel, a little bit of that type of technique. Um, what else? When you're designing the corn-fed caddis, what were you trying to achieve that did not exist in other existing caddis patterns? Good question. So one, I liked the use of CDC, but all the existing CDC patterns I'd seen were much too sparse for my liking, uh, and oftentimes very hard to see. So I wanted a fly that had a little bit of a trailing shuck, could be kind of an emerger, but sat high enough that could also be mistaken for an adult. So it's a pretty good transitional fly. Uh, I've also, when I've frequented other shops, I've been, uh, one shop in Montana I went to had a little uh, bin of, the, of my corn feds at the, at the front desk, and I saw the bin there, and I thought, oh, these are closeout flies? And they, they laughed and said, no, that's one of our hottest flies right now because we have a few caddis around and a few betis. They had the olive color there. And they said this fly is kind of crossover enough that it passes for most of our fish for a betis or a caddis. So it's, it's a good fly that just works in, in either situation in a lot of cases. Um, outside of that, I hadn't seen flies that use the CDC hackle. So as I mentioned, I like having that soft CDC fly. Fish just get it in their mouth easier. So I get a better hookup rate with a softer CDC fly. Um, what else? Hi from snowy Wisconsin. Hello from snowy Utah. Finally, we're getting some snow today. We need the water. Uh, what is the best way to dress this fly starting out and then after it gets saturated? So I start by, dr by uh, dressing mine with Tiemco Dry Magic. And when it gets saturated, I use the rubber band trick or I really use like uh, Spanflex, the little loop that I tie on my vest. You hook the hook, the fly onto the loop of Spanflex and then you strum the tippet. Again, there's a YouTube video about that on our, on our Fly Fish Food YouTube channel. You can check that one out. But that will expel most of the water. And then I would, if, if it's totally dry again, you can just put dry magic back on. If it's still a little saturated, I would stick it in Shimazaki Dry Shake, shake it up, and work some of that powder right into the CDC. That helps get it floating and ready to catch fish again. One thing of note, CDC patterns and really all caddis patterns for me fish better when they're really high floating. Um, if you know, even a, a, a display that's designed to sit kind of half in, half out, the back end can sit in, but the top of it needs to sit pretty high. It seems like fish like high floating caddis patterns. All right. Um, somebody asked, what's my favorite fish? I don't know. I don't really have a favorite fish. Aren't all fish cool? There's no such thing as a bad fish. <laughs> Just depends on the season. Uh, no bad fish. All right, let's move on. We've covered the corn-fed caddis. Let's uh, move to the next fly. The next fly is the stubby chubby. Um, this one's going to be demonstrated by my friend Josh Grafham from Umpqua. Uh, I haven't seen this video, so I'm looking forward to it, but we sell the, the stubby chubbies, have for a couple of years now in the shop here, and they sell really, really well. The stubby chubby is really cool to me. It's kind of a blend or maybe a refreshed take on the standard chubby Chernobyl. It's a little smaller, a little more sparse, a little bit less wing. You know, because of that, it's not as buoyant maybe. But I think uh, as I talked to Josh about this fly, he said he likes it for late summer, more pressured fish. You know, when they've, they're still willing to look up, but they've seen every big bushy fly under the sun come by them all summer long. You want to maybe opt for something that's got a little lower profile. And the stubby chubby is that fly. It also has some cool features like little tags on the back, hot colors. Um, pink, orange, that kind of stuff, little teeny tags sticking out the back. Uh, they, the stubby chubbies are available in size 10 through 18, and they come in a wide variety of colors. So you can get them in more imitative stuff like uh, like a yellow, let's say, or there's even some that are more on the flip side of that, a little more attractor style like purple. 
Uh, that's one of our best sellers. There's a UV cinnamon that's really, really popular. Anyway, it's a cool fly that's really taken off. Um, one thing I want to mention about it too, about this fly that I'm sure Josh will touch on the video. I apologize. I haven't seen this video, so he's probably going to touch on all this stuff, but it uses the Umpqua stubby T uh, hook. So there's a hook that's basically specifically designed for this style of fly. The hook is not limited to only this fly. It's perfect for all of what I would call smallish foam patterns. It's got a little stronger wire, so it's good for big fish. Uh, that also helps right it. It makes the fly land you know, with the foam side up and hook side down, which you want. Uh, it's got a nice wide gap, but it's not overly long like a lot of uh, big foam hooks are. So anyway, it's a really cool fly, a really cool hook. Uh, it's called the XT050, the Umpqua Stubby T hook. Check that one out if you haven't already. Uh, without further ado, let's just jump into this video and watch Josh show us how to tie the Stubby Chubby. All right, hey guys, this is Josh Grafton with Umpqua Fed Emergence. Today we're going to tie the Stubby Chubby. Um, to start, I'm going to tie this fly on a size 12 Stubby T hook. This is an awesome hook for kind of your, your, your small dries. It's got a wide gap on it with a V-lock bend. And it's a medium wire hook. This allows me to make kind of a bigger body than some of those hackled flies or some of those foam flies. Um, that wide gap allows you to still get some gap and penetration on that. You put a nice little thread body down, come back here, and at the back I'm going to add a, I'm going to take a short piece of glow bright thread, I like to use this hot pink, UV hot pink, and we're going to set two strands on top, and I'm going to flash that down right at the bend of the hook, and then we're going to come back with the second one and kind of fold it over, that's going to be four strands sticking out the back. I like to keep this hot spot small and relatively thin. I'm going to cut it almost flush with the bend of the hook. Doesn't need to be a long sticking out there, just a little hot spot so the, the fish can see it off the back. Then I'm going to take some UV purple dubbing and I want to create a small ball of dubbing right on the back of that hook right there. So we're going to, a little small amount of dubbing, this little bit goes a long ways. Just create a little dubbing right there. And I'm going to kind of walk it back. Just a little, and I'm going to create a little ball right there. So once we have that ball of purple dubbing there, we're going to take some two millimeter black foam, cut about a quarter inch strip out of it. Once we have the strip cut, I'm going to take that little strip of foam, and I'm going to cut a V in the end of it. I'm going to basically want to create the, the back half of a, of a, of a stone fly. So you can see that right there. I'm going to set this foam right on right in front of that little ball of dubbing. And we're going to come up and over the top with one loose wrap. I'm going to cinch it straight down. We're going to do a second loose wrap and really kind of tighten it down so this splays that foam out in the back just a little bit. And then a couple more wraps really secure to the shank of the hook. So once that foam is on there, we're going to grab that purple UV dubbing again. And like I was saying before, we want to keep this real thin and light. We don't want the UV, excuse me, the purple dubbing to take over the whole body. We're going to keep it nice and thin. Just kind of roll that dubbing on there. Right before we add this dubbing and come over the top, we're going to take two sets of legs, one on each side. I like to use the a flexi floss style leg real thin. I like to use the, the fine diameter ones. I want it to be barred. And I like these flexi floss ones better because they, they don't seem to rot and they seem to have a nice motion with, with being nice and thin. They still move really well. So we're going to set that right on the side, tie it up into the foam, then we can adjust the leg where you want it. It's important to get these sticking straight out to the side. Dubbing down for a second. We're going to do the other leg. I like to set it, come right up the middle. So 
put it on top. And once you have the one wrap, I kind of adjust where that leg is sitting. Let me give it a little bit of tension and a little splay out. Getting it to set on the foam sometimes can be a little funny. Once you have it set right, you can make your wraps. And I'm going to come right through with the dubbing and split those legs. There we go. That'll keep them in place. We'll do one more with the dubbing. That keeps a nice little gap there. Gets them to stick out straight. Let me straighten this guy up a little bit. There we go. Secure that foam down. I'm going to come right in front of it with the purple dubbing. When we make a nice small body, then we're going to secure the foam right up in the front. I want to make sure to leave plenty of room in the, in the head of the fly so we can come in front of that foam and get some dubbing up in front there as well. I'm going to do three or four lashes down, get that foam nice and tight. And then up here, we are going to do the legs last. We're going to start with the wing. So we're going to use a nice neutral color um, wing material. I like tans. This is a blended material, poly yarn material. I'm going to kind of brush it out of my hands, get it nice and straight. I want those fibers sitting straight, nice and thin where I'm going to lash it down. So we're going to come right on top, one loose wrap. Get it nice and secure. Another heavy wrap right there. Third one. And then you're going to take the material, you're going to fold it back. And I like to create a little bump there. I'm going to lash the whole bump down on top. There we go. So that should be straight right there. So I'm going to add the wing there. I'm going to leave that long for right now. I'm going to trim that up near the end. We're going to add, um, we're going to do the legs now. I'm going to have these legs off to the side. Same legs as the back, the brown, tan, flexi floss legs, like the fine ones. I'm going to tie this side in. Again, one loose wrap. I adjust the leg to where I want it. Then we can do a little tighter wrap right over the top. These also can be adjusted kind of near the end because they tend to move around a little bit. On the other side, come up through the middle, lash it down almost on the top, take the leg, and we're going to move it around. Make sure it goes right down into the side. Try and give it a nice little, little tension. Get it nice and square there. And then to finish off the wing, we're going to take a, some of that same poly yarn, but we're going to do a much smaller bit, and we're going to do a fluorescent pink. Want a little hot spot right on the wing that you can see this fly even in low light and from a distance. A couple wraps there. I'm going to take this pink and I'm going to fold it back just like I did the other one. Come over the top on the two. Make sure everything is straight. And then I'm going to take the separate the pink and the tan. I'm going to cut this one real short. You just need a small hot spot there to see that wing. I'm going to straighten that wing out. Then I'm going to cut the wing just behind the bend of the fly there. So that's the wing. That should be nice and straight. We'll brush it out at the end. Take a little of that UV purple dubbing. Thin it out. And we're going to come right over the top and in between the legs. Make sure those legs stay nice and spread out. There we go. Trim everything up. A couple wraps right over in between the legs and right over the, the wing material. And then come right in front of the foam to kind of prop that foam up in the, in the very front. Pull everything back. One, two, three. Tighten up the thread. We're going to run a quick finish right in front. Again, pushing the foam back and the dubbing back just a little bit. Nice and tight right there. That should be good. And now we're going to trim everything up. So I like to start with the legs. I'll look, make sure they're nice and even on both sides, nice and square. They tend to have a little natural bend to them. I'm going to cut them about the shank length long. You can always cut more off, so I'm going to start a little longer. I grab all four. I like to make a nice even cut. And then I take a look and see how square they are. I need a little bit more. I'm going to shorten them up. I don't want these to be crazy long. 
enough, long enough to get some good movement, but not overtaking the whole bug. There we go. That's a good length right there. I'm going to take the wing. I'm going to brush this guy back. Let's get this fibers nice and straight. Sometimes they like to clump up with just a tiny bit. Get those nice and straight. And then we're going to take the front foam. We're just going to square this off. So I'm going to give myself a little extra foam to work with. Square it off right there. And then I'm going to cut the corners of it. Be careful not to cut the legs off. Kind of get it nice and even. Cut the little corners off the foam. I like to leave a nice little front head kind of so I can skate this fly, skitter it around a little bit. Um, it kind of stays above the surface. That is the stubby chubby. Perfect for summertime attractor dry fly fishing, fishing a nymph behind it, twitching it, fishing it close to a bank. Great terrestrial, everything attractor. Easy to see. Nice and small, um, lots of color options, lots of variations. You can go big and bright, you can go dark and natural. Um, but this thing is a great floater, great fish attractor, awesome all around summertime pattern. Thanks a lot. All right, we're live. Back from Josh showing us that awesome stubby chubby. That was the purple one. Again, they're available in lots of colors. It's a great fly. Uh, we did get a couple of questions that came in while he was tying. Um, let's see here. First, do you fish barbed or barbless with dry flies? I fish barbless. Uh, I, I sometimes fish a, or tie them on a barbed hook like that last one that was pictured and then pinch the barb flat. That way, if I tie on just a, a straight barbless hook and I want to tie to the bend of the hook to fish a dry and a dropper, the dropper sometimes slips off the bend. But if you have just a barb that's been pinched flat, usually there's enough of a nub there that the tippet won't slide off the back. So I always debarb mine or just tie them on barbless hooks to begin with. But that's up to you. I would encourage you to fish barbless hooks. They're easier to get out of you. They're easier to get out of the fish. You release fish quicker with them. They penetrate better. Uh, as long as you keep a nice tight line while you're fighting the fish, you really don't lose any more fish on a barbless hook than you do a barbed fly. Uh, next question, can the stubby chubby be fished in the same way as the chubby Chernobyl, or would you use it differently since it's maybe less buoyant? And yeah, you can fish it the same. Um, it is less buoyant, so it's not going to hold up as big of a bead or as big of a nymph if you're fishing it with a dry and a dropper. Uh, it doesn't have the same profile because it's designed to be a smaller fly, but again, when the fish are getting picky and you need to be a little more sneaky, uh, the ch stubby chubby is the way to go. All right, next one. What's the deal with the V-lock, Ben? I can't pretend to tell you what the technology is there. Uh, it, all I know is it works. I can tell you this. I caught my personal best, uh, longest cutthroat this year on still water on that V-lock stubby T-hook. I tied a size 10 hopper on it and landed a 29-inch cut on a dry fly on a lake. So I'm convinced that it holds. It works really, really well. Um, Again, I don't know what the, the magic, what the technology is there, but it's a cool little bend. Uh, I use some other hooks that are similar to that have a little sharper bend there that seem to retain fish really, really well. All right, next question. Novice tire here, and on small terrestrial patterns, sometimes they tend to float a lot on their side. I glue the foam so it's not slipping. Any advice? Uh, hard to say there without seeing your fly, but maybe try, make sure you're putting legs out there. Legs can work as outriggers, just like on that stubby tee or on that uh, stubby chubby, I mean, the legs kind of work to balance the fly. They, they give you a, a little bit of stability on each side. Some flies are designed with wings uh, that stick out the side to help balance that fly and make it land correctly. The other option is to make sure you're using a hook that's heavy enough that it anchors in. You don't want a hook that's so heavy that it's sinking the fly, obviously. But on a lot of foam flies, we don't use standard dry fly hooks because the foam is dense enough and has enough mass that they want to ride on their side or upside down even. So sometimes using a nymph or a streamer hook, uh, or in this case that stubby T hook, has just heavy enough wire to fix that, that uh, fly to where it lands hooked down all the time. So maybe try that out. Uh, what else? you have any special advice for practicing casting, like you say with micro or euro leaders? Well, my first advice is don't use micro or euro leaders for dry fly fishing. That's not what they're for. They're for nymphing. 
um, for otherwise, if you're nymphing with them, you just got to get time on the water with them. They are tough to cast. Uh, what is the best floating to use on the stubby chubby or foam in general? Any floating really works pretty well on them. Any of your standard floatants, just some like Dave's bug du or bug float or uh, uh, again, the Tiemco dry magic works great on foam flies. Uh, I tend to favor thicker floatants most of the time on my foam flies, but uh, when you have a nice poly wing or something, again, using Shimazaki Dry Shake works really well, too. Um, what can you do to make the body sit lower in the back? That would, would that help the profile? Sure could if that's the profile you're looking for. Uh, to make it sit lower, you could thin out the foam in the back so it has less buoyancy in the back of the fly. You could tie a dubbed body on a curved shank hook that makes it so the float sits up high, but the shank hangs kind of down into the water below it. That's another option. Um, lots of things you could do there. You could also just use a heavier hook to make it sit lower. Um, that's about all I can think of to help that profile. So with that in mind, let's move to the next fly. The next fly is a really cool one, one you've probably seen before. It's uh, Mike Mercer's Missing Link. Uh, he designed this awesome crossover fly to kind of be a little bit of a jack of all trades. I got an opportunity to chat with Mike a little before uh, this presentation and got some of his ideas on it. And he sent me an article that he did for Fly Fishery Magazine that may be available online, I'm not sure. Uh, but he had one of the, I guess, and I read the article, and one of the things that really stood out to me was that he mentioned uh, the intuitive part of fly design. And, and um, he thought, in his article, he said that he thinks that this is a feature of fly design that is oftentimes ignored. And I think he's right. He, he encouraged us as anglers to keep an open mind when it comes to um, how fish perceive our flies and how we see the flies. Those don't always match up. Um, I think most fly designers would agree there seems to be some sort of, um, I don't know, a measurable amount of angler intuition that goes into most uh, signature flies, most patterns that are designed. And usually that comes from lots of time on the water, lots of time watching fish, watch it, lots of time watching fish reject and accept flies. Um, and I think that's a key factor in, in designing flies, and not only designing flies for, for you know, fish, but for a lot of flies, I would argue, are designed for fishermen and not for fish. So having spent lots of time on the water, uh, I can tell you that helps with your intuition as a, as a fly tire. And Mike really hit that home in his article. It was a cool article to read. Um, so that I don't butcher some of his words, I'm going to read from my notes here some of Mike's thoughts on the missing link. He said, the fly's design was proven to make it equally productive as a mayfly merger, adult or spinner, as an adult or dying egg-laying caddis, or as a small stone fly or flying ant. So it's a very, very versatile fly, very uh, kind of, I called it a crossover at the beginning. Something about the design engenders a very real sense of confidence in fish. They will often eat the fly, even if it is larger than the hatch that, that it's being used for. It's a very effective fly for even the most challenging of trout. When fish are eating flies that are difficult to see on the water, such as mayfly spinners, dead caddis, uh, the spent wings on the missing link make this fly very attractive to the fish. And then it also has an elk hair upwing that makes it easy for us, the anglers, to see. Uh, the incredible versatility of this dry makes it many anglers go to first choice in almost all dry fly situations, regardless of the hatch, from tiny blooming olives up to large green drakes and in flat water to choppy ripples. This fly is equally effective in matching hatches to rising trout or prospecting when no fish are rising. So Mike basically summed that one up so well. I didn't want to bother you with my version of his take on it. He designed the fly. He knows it best. Uh, let's watch Mike now teach us how to tie the missing link. All right, today we're going to tie the, the, the missing link. Um, this pattern is one that I've tied probably a, almost a decade ago, initially eight or ten years ago, and it's been one of my most popular flies. Um, I'm really proud of it because um, unlike a lot of nymphs, which you can kind of force feed the fish if you absolutely have to, with a dry fly you bring the fish. The fish has to voluntarily come to this thing. It has to come to the surface to eat, which takes more effort than a nymph to start with. And then when he gets there, he's usually got a fairly long time to look at it. And so he's going to say yes or no. 
um, a, a large number of fish tend to say yes to this. And interestingly to me, it covers a lot of insect bases. Um, when I originally tied it, I tied it, I used it almost exclusively on a 16. And this is a 102Y hook, incidentally, which is uh, actually, a, uh, this is a size 15. Um, they come in all sizes. But when I used it, I'd use a 16, and, and I'd go places when there was a little betas hatches, little small 20s, 22s, and I'd use my 16, look like a gunship come through them, and the fish would still eat them. And it's like, wow, that's, I haven't seen that before. So there's something in it that engenders confidence. There's something about the profile, the way the fly sits in the water, um, whatever it is, I don't pretend to know exactly what, but they just tend to really go for it. And remember, I tied it as a dead caddis imitation. That was what I tied it for initially. And so I've come to realize it does work for that, but it works for so much more. Almost all the insects, the, the mayflies, the caddis, the small stones, um, small ants and, and beetles even, they'll eat it for such a wide array of insects and such a wide array of situations, fast water, slow water, um, that it's just, I, I literally use this as my dry fly of choice um, I can honestly say probably close to 80% of the time. It just it just works so well that I, I just don't I don't use parachute atoms anymore. I don't use elk hair cast, the flies I used to use a lot. I just don't pull them out very much because this fly doesn't. And then so it's engendered confidence in me, and so I just know it's gonna work, and so it kind of works both ways. But so as I mentioned, it's a it's a Timco 102Y. I, I started tying this fly quite a few years ago and that was a light wire dry fly hook that had a wide gap at that point. I still like it. I just, the, the, the UMC 100 works perfectly well, and, and a lot of times I'll use that too, but the 102 wire, as long as I'm not fishing for exceptionally large fish in very heavy current, is still probably my go-to. My home water is the lower sack, and uh, we are looking at very large fish in, ha in heavy water, so usually I'll use a 100 or even a 9300 sometimes, but usually a, a TMC 100 is perfect for that. Um, but just for old time's sake, I'll tie this one on a 102Y. Um, one thing that's fairly unusual, as you'll notice as I'm wrapping the, the, the initial base of thread wrap on this, is I'm bringing it all the way back almost to a midway point on the hook. Um, and uh, you know, if I was, when I, when I first tied this, I was tying it, as I mentioned, as a dead caddis imitation, fishing on the lower Sacramento. And I thought, you know, those things are so messed up and gobby looking when they're dead that you know I want I want a lot of that I want, want a lot of that fly to be sitting back in the water. So I mean I, I purposely tied it way back like that. Um, as it turns out, you know, in the years that, that, that came, I've come to believe that this 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 kind of tying style has created a, a shuck. I think that fish see this more as a shuck than they do just as the end of a body sticking back there. Um, and I've tied different things, again, tying by attrition, leaving parts out or tying this fly so it starts, you know, above the hook point bend and stuff. It just doesn't seem to, to work quite as well. And so I think it is kind of a shuck design, even though it was uh, um, just kind of luck on my part. I wasn't trying to do that. So I'll take a single strand of pearl flashaboo and wrap back over it, clear back to where I initially wrapped initially. Follow my thread back to that halfway point and then back up. So I'm trying to keep the body pretty uniform in size. No taper really, just trying to keep it about the same. Real thin, you know, not much thicker than the hook shank. And I'll stop at about the midway point of the hook. Uh, as with all missing links, whether this or the honey ant or different variations, I try to keep a lot of open hook shank below behind the eye because the last couple steps eat up a lot of hook shank. So uh, trying to keep the fly kind of far back. Now I'll tie this rib. And again, I've come to believe that this rib is really is really imitating a shuck, like a rib shuck, more than it is a ribbed nymph or you know, emerging nymph body, so to speak. It's actually the shuck part of that anyway. And the rib is pretty close, just to allow a little bit of brown thread to show through. So there is a stripe effect. And then to keep it from blowing up on the first fish that eats it, I'll put a little UV on it. Bring it all the way back. Get up on there and you can use a, a bodkin to kind of even it out a little bit, take off any excess that needs coming off. And just the, the UV allows it not only to, to, to withstand a trout's teeth, but also gives it a little bit of a sheen, a little bit of a depth, um, which is kind of a neat, kind of a neat effect, I think. I 
was like that. A lot of bugs do have sheen, whether it be trapped air bubbles or just slick little bodies. And so I do kind of like what this does. I, I initially used Softex for this. Softex works great. I really like it, but the fumes are horrific. And so I finally got tired of going to bed with headaches and said, you know what? I think that the UV products will work fine. And in fact, they do. The fish don't seem to care at all. Um, sometimes it, some, I know people have used epoxy. The problem with epoxy is that it's heavy. And sometimes it'll pull the, the back of that bug down too far. It'll want to pull the fly almost into straight up and down, which I don't want. Um, so the thin coat of the UV seems usually seems about right. Uh, at this point, I'm going to use a little, what I call a, a wing splitter. And what it is, is it's a UV brown ice dub. And it's just a kind of a mixture with a, a kind of a, a little a little UV fibers mixed in there that really give great highlights. When it gets wet, it looks very subdued, but has like it looks kind of like it has little lights within it. Um, like inside lights that will play out when it gets, especially when it gets wet. And I want just enough of this so that when I tie my down wings in, it will keep them separated. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. So just a nice little ball of, of, of dubbing, about that big. Too big and it looks weird. I mean, you know, it just doesn't look right. And um, I want it, but too small and it won't achieve its purpose of splitting my down wings. Now the down wings, are light done Z-line. And a lot of times you'll pull off a, a, a hanklet like this and you don't want to tie that in. That's way, way too much. Uh, I'm just going to split that in half. Um, sometimes I can split it again, but there I've got maybe 10 fibers or so, 10, 12 fibers, and that's plenty. I do not want more than that. I could use six and it's going to work just fine. I'll use a dozen, 10 or 12 because I like the way it looks. Um, so I'm going to tie that in right in front of that dubbing ball and wrap back over it so it butts right up against that dubbing ball. And when it does that, it'll want to kick out a little bit, almost like a spinner wing. Maybe my spinner wings would out to the side. And I'll take, I'll go ahead and trim them to shape right now. About, I'll line up about with the bend of the hook. And I'll preen them down just a little bit um, so they'll kind of be out of the way the rest of the tying steps. But at this point, you can see it looks quite a bit like a mayfly spinner with the down wings to the side, uh, just exactly the way I would tie a spinner in, in many cases. Um, and I think that the one of the beauties of the missing link is its a, ability to mimic a lot of different things. Could be a mayfly done emerging, could be a, a spinner, could be a spent, it could be a, a spent and dying sinking mayfly, it could be a lot of different things. Same thing with caddis. It was in, initially tied as a caddis, but I quickly realized it maybe even a better mayfly than it is a caddis. Um, also does well for little yellow stones, small stoneflies, beetles, ants, stuff like that. Just a lot of things that, that, that eat it. Now for the, the up wing, I'm going to bring my thread up a little bit, still not coming all the way to the eye, but bring it up and back, just creating a little solid thread foundation. Um, because when I tie on the, the elk, uh, I don't want it to spin on my hook. So a thread foundation will really help keep that from happening. Uh, I really like cow elk. Cow elk is very hollow, very blunt. The tips are very blunt, almost no little black tips at all. Black tips to me, they're kind of useless. They stick out and create length without any benefit. They're skinny little things that don't float well. So with the really blunt cow elk tips, they're useful right to the tip. They're blunt, they're hollow. They, they help float the fly really, really well. And I, I like that golden hue that they have too. Just a nice, it's a really nice hair. Again, that's cow elk. Clip it off the hide, and then of course have to get the the little under fur out so it'll stack well. Just kind of preen that out a little bit, and ready for the stacker. A few taps, and we've got our stacked hair. Ready to be pulled out. Now at this point, you can kind of see, maybe I've got a little bit too much hair, won't tie down well. I'll remove some of it just to get the right bulk and density. And I'll, at this point too, I'll just I'll measure the distance. And I want it just about the length of the hook shank. That's about what I want there. I'll measure it, change hands. I'm gonna tie it down 
start tying it down behind, you know, right midway between the eye and the dubbing ball, and then wrap back over it, back to the dubbing ball. And it's a lot of thread. And the people say, well, you know, why, why do I have so much thread? That's odd on a dry fly. But actually, you'll see when we tie it, the, the, the stacked hair to the back and the unstacked hair to the front are going to pull up, and, and they're going to have a multifunctional purpose that I'll explain when we get there. But at this point, we've got the stacked hair, and we've got the non-stacked hair. This, the unstacked hair, I'm going to lift up, post up underneath it a little bit, just to kind of try to get it to one nice clump of hair. And then I'm going to choose my hackle. And for the hackle, I use different different colors and things for different um, flies. But for the traditional um, missing link, I'll usually use a dun hackle. Um, dark dun, usually light dun is okay. Um, but um, I do like the dun. It's interesting. I start, I before the missing link, I almost never use dun hackle. It's just odd. I can't even remember why I use it exactly. But I started, and it's just one of those just serendipitous things where I've tried other hackles colors since on the original dark brown color, and none seem to work quite as well. I just do like this done color. So it made me a believer in done where I'd never used it before. Um, sometimes sometimes in fly tying, I find that uh, intuitiveness plays a bigger role than, than uh, just smart thinking. Sometimes we can't really know. We make, we make fortuitous choices that we don't really know why, but we do, and then we, we find out, hey, that really worked well. I wonder why. And we may never know, know why, but um, I think there's a lot to flight time more than just, just getting everything exactly perfectly correct the way in our minds, because there's so much we can't know in flight time that, you know, my whole thing is what do the fish see? Um, but how do we know exactly how fish see? We have some idea, but um, not always perfect. So I'm going to wrap the hackle around everything, both the stacked and non-stacked hair. Wrap around several times. Capture it. Tie it off on the hook. And you can see that even though I left a lot of hook shank open, this tying this, there's still, it came pretty close to the eye. So you do have to be careful when you do that when you tie the fly. Make sure you leave plenty of space there. And bit of extra, cut off, a little bit of a whip finish, and then the final step is to pull those unstacked hairs forward. Good tension on them so they're all together. Reach in with the tips of the scissors. Cut those fairly short. And so getting back to why the, why I have the, the thread between the two clumps of hairs, when you do this, when you have a little bit of space between them, it forces, when you, when you tie the hackle in, the hackle forces the blunt ends and the stacked ends to come almost straight up together. And so it, it really helps, it gives a high wing profile so the angler can see that, that wing profile really well on the water. If you take it straight down, almost like an elk or caddis, it's much more difficult to see on the water. Plus, a lot of bugs, when they hatch, are going to, this, this fly will kind of sit butt down in the water, almost, you know, like a modified cling cam or nothing that dramatic. But um, you're going to, you're going to, the, the back end is going to sink in the water. And, got a little straight here. Um, and it's going to give you just that, that, that those wings are going to remain visible. And if you want to skate this fly, the little um, short blunt tips up front will help you skate the fly in the water. Very often in lower Sacramento where I fish, we'll find um, fish skiing on caddis that have hatched and are skating the bank. So we'll cast this missing link out, skate it up, drop it, skate it up, drop it. And it'll skate for a very frail looking fly. It skates very well. And the fish just annihilate it. Most of the time I'm dead drifting it. but so you've got the, the what I have come to believe is the shock, the thread body and the, 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 the shiny rib. You've got a wing splitter underneath of the, the UV brown dubbing, the wings that you split, which are the light dun Zelon yarn upwing of the cow elk and a nice dark dun hackle, the parachute style. That's the missing link. If I had one fly, dry fly to fish, 
No question, that's going to be the one. All right, that was awesome. Thanks, Mike. That's a really cool looking fly. I really like that missing link. It's a top seller in our shop for sure. Good transition fly, works for mayflies, works for caddis, as Mike mentioned. Uh, we had a few more questions that came through while he was tying. Uh, the first one is, these flies so far look very different. How do you choose between them on the water? And that's a great question. Uh, so much of that's going to depend on whether you're trying to match the hatch, whether you're trying to fish an attractor, you know, trying to be imitative, and so on. Uh, if there are lots of caddis about, I would probably tend towards either that missing link or the corn fed, uh, at least that we've seen so far. If the there was nothing around, um, maybe lean more towards the stubby chubby to where it's more of an attractor, a little bigger profile, might have a little more interest from a fish that's not already looking up. Uh, but hard question to answer concretely. There, there is no good answer there, but uh, you always just have to rely on some experience and what you think the fish are keying into. And when all else fails, why not try all three? Um, next question is why on that last video, why do you pull out the under fur? And uh, the reason I would pull out the under fur is because under fur, well, two reasons. One, under fur offers no flotation, so it's just going to hold water, so we want to get rid of it. But more importantly, under fur kind of binds the fibers that we want to stack and uses our wing. It holds them together and makes stacking those fibers to get the tips nice and straight much more difficult. So you remove the under fur to get rid of, uh, to get rid of it, in essence, and make it easier to stack and also make it so the fly is more buoyant. Um, another question, you talked about twitching versus skating the corn-fed caddis. How would you fish this fly, this fly meaning the missing link? And just to be clear, uh, I fish the corn-fed caddis most of the time dead drift for sure, but it's also a fun fly to twitch or skate or um, you know, jig up and down with a dropper below it. Uh, same with the missing link, as Mike mentioned there very eloquently. You can fish it dead drift, you can twitch it, you can skate it, you can do all kinds of things with it. Um, it, you're just going to have to play that by ear based on what the fish are after and what kind of presentation they like. Um, how does his whip finish differ from using the tool or does it not really? It doesn't really differ. You're still whip finishing. You can just do it by hand or you can use the tool. Uh, for me, I have relatively rough fingers as you probably saw in my video. Uh, I have uh, chronically dry skin. So when I whip finish, uh, I tend to, sh to fray the thread with my fingers. So I always use a tool. Um, if you have those, what I call nice, not nice, uh, soft office hands, you know, like some of those people that are stuck in a poor office, poor souls. Um, I kid, I kid. If you have nice, soft hands that I'm jealous of, then you could probably get away with a standard whip finish with just your fingers. Either one will work. I tend to have a little more control personally using the tool, but that's not the case for everybody. Lots of people love doing just a hand whip finish. It ties the same knot either way. Um, what else? What else? What goes into designing a fly for Umqua? Any tips? Well, I don't know that anybody specifically says I'm going to design a fly for Umqua. It's usually more I want to design a fly. Uh, for me personally, it's what am I encountering on the river that's that that's I'm having flies where my needs are not being met. My you know fly that's not floating well enough, a fly that's not imitative enough, a fly that's the wrong color, a fly that's the wrong silhouette, and nymphs a fly that sinks too fast or a fly that sinks too slow a fly that's missing key ingredients like a wing case or legs or just the right body colors uh, in a streamer, the right motion, the right length of tail and so on. They're, every fly designer is going to have their own reasons for the flies that they're making. Um, I won't pretend to know why everyone, uh, you know, what their reasoning is. For me, it's usually to, to overcome some sort of hurdle I've encountered on the water. Um, all good questions. Keep them coming. All right. Moving along, our next fly is a really cool one. As I mentioned earlier, it's a brand new fly for 2022 from Josh Schmitherman. He calls it his pint caddis. Uh, again, I got a chance to just exchange some messages with Josh about his fly. Um, so let me just read to you what I, I just asked basically for quick bullet points to uh, help everybody that's watching understand some of the design philosophies and design process of these flies. So Josh responded saying, I needed a caddis pattern that would float better than the traditional patterns. I also wanted a pattern that would have a little movement in the water without sacrificing buoyancy. The thin re thinly spiraled extended foam body gives a great segmented abdomen that floats extremely well. 
The spun CDC thorax not only aids in giving this pattern an abnormal amount of buoyancy, but also solves the movement problem. CDC is soft and has a lot of movement on its own. An issue that often occurs with rounded foam-bodied flies is they tend to roll a little bit. By rolling means they tend to roll side to side. He fixed that problem by splitting the L care wing to each side of this pattern. Like we were talking earlier, you need kind of stabilizers on the fly. So Josh has built that into this pattern. Um, the split wing acts as a stabilizer. I sometimes call them outriggers uh, on both sides of the body, allowing it to float correctly on every drift. Uh, the pint caddis, this is a new one. I've not fished this. This is actually the first time I've ever seen this was in the catalog and for the next year from Umpqua. And so this is probably the first sneak peek for just about everybody on planet Earth at this cool pint caddis. It's available in two colors, black and in tan. Uh, the black color only in available in size 18, and the tan is available in 16 and 18. So let's watch Josh now uh, demonstrate his cool new fly called the pint, excuse me, called the pint caddis. So in tying the pint caddis, we're going to have an extended body. So you're going to need an extended body tool, a needle. This is just a piece of wire. Anything like that's going to work really well. Uh, this is Beavis 12 aught, uh, just a small diameter thread. And this is 0.5 millimeter razor foam. So if you get it from Wapsie, there's uh, 0.5 and one millimeter, you want, definitely want to use the smaller of the two. But I'm going to start by just pinching a small strip right on top of this piece of wire. And I'm going to wrap right on top of that, tying it down. Make sure I'm off that little tag in the thread there. Don't have to wrap it too tight, you just don't want it to split. I just go up once and back down and I whip finish there. And you can go ahead and trim your thread off. So we've got probably three inches here hanging out the back. Now I'm gonna just apply super glue to it while I wrap and I'm just gonna wrap it up just like this all the way to the front. It's real simple. And any you know, kind of liquid super glue works really well for this. Just kind of add a little bit, smooth it out. You can always add more as you go. Got a little excess coming out there. You can just wipe that off. I always go up a little further than I probably need to, just to make sure I have enough. Once we get there, just pull that body right off. There we are, there's our extended body. Take out that little piece of wire there. And put in our hook. And this is, this is a size 16 here, uh, but it's a stubby T hook from Umpqua. Great hook, lots of hook gap. So I'm tying this in. We want about a hook shank length out the back there. So it's gonna stick out right around there. Now I'm gonna come in, cut this. I'm, you wanna leave some to tie in. Uh, and then I'm also gonna just poke a hole right down the middle here. Right where that hook needs to go through. We'll take the hook out. And we're just gonna slide that through. There we go. Just like that right there. 
Once that's on there, I'll just come in, just add a little bit of glue. Just to make sure it stays in place. We're gonna tie on top of it as well, so it's really probably not gonna move. It's just probably not super necessary, but a little bit of security. Start our thread base. This is that same Visa thread, 12 aught, nice and thin. 70 denier, the UTC works great too. And all my tying is gonna be from about the hook point forward. So I'm gonna leave definitely some foam exposed on the hook there. I'm just gonna tie all this down so we have a nice little ramp. There we are. Next steps, take CDC feather. It's just a tan CDC feather. Just gonna tie it in with kind of the stem out the back along with the body. And again, I'm going right to about the hook point. And then I'm gonna just trim off the tip here. And tie all that down. There we go. We're just gonna leave that hanging out the back for a little while. Next step, just take some elk hair here. This is just select cow elk. Uh, not a whole lot, just kind of your typical, you know, size 16 caddis mount. Get all this under fur out here. And we're gonna just stick it in the hair stacker. Tips down so the tips all aligned real nice. Couple taps, pull apart. There we go. Now I want these to end up being a little shy of that tail. About right there is great, so I'm gonna just pinch it to the hook there. Tie it down. We're tying down right behind the eye. A couple nice tight wraps. I'm still pinching it and I'm just going to work my way back. Some of these fibers in the front, you got to kind of comb back as you go. But I'm going to go almost all the way to the back. I'm going to leave a little bit of space there between the abdomen and our elk hair. Got the stray hair there. There we go. I'm gonna just tie this down nice and tight. There we are. Come back to the elk hair. And I have two CDC feathers here and just a you know clip. This is the Petty Jean Magic Tool, you can do the Swiss CDC clamp, whatever whatever works for you. Uh, but that's two, you can do just one, uh, but you really need kind of the whole feather amount of CDC. So I'm gonna just cut the stems off here. There we go, just like that. And you can do whatever you want here. Um, you can do a dubbing loop, you can split your thread, however you want to thin this CDC up. I prefer just split the thread. And put all that CDC in there and leave a good little bit hanging out the back. You don't want it too close to the thread because you actually do want a little bit of fluffiness to it. Go. I'm just gonna spin the bobbin here. And these uh, adjustable double arm bobbins from Umclip spin very nice. They're super balanced. If you like to split your thread, I'd highly recommend trying one. All right. Take a brush and just kind of brush some of these fibers out. All right, 
So my first wrap, I'm actually gonna come behind this elk here. Actually my first two wraps, I'm gonna go behind that elk here. Kind of helps stand it up. It also just ends up with a buggier fly when, when you do that. And the rest, I'm just gonna wrap forward, kind of palmer as you go. But you know, as much as you can, let my thread unwind here so it's strong again. There we go. All right. Just gonna come back in here and pick out any trapped CDC fibers. There will definitely be some. All right, now I'm gonna take my needle here and I'm just gonna split this elk hair in half. Just creating two wings. And I'm gonna take this CDC feather that we've had hanging out the back this whole time. Just gonna bring it over the top. Just gonna pull it tight. We're gonna tie it right there behind the elk hair head. I typically get two loose wraps and kind of pull tight and it kind of helps lay out the, those wings a little bit more. Get a couple nice tight wraps. Then I'm gonna just fold all this back, get right there behind the eye, and we can whip finish. Trim our thread there. And then pull all the elk hair and that CDC stem forward, just like you would an elk hair caddis. Line your scissors right there in front of the eye of the hook. Just snip it there. And then this is kind of an optional thing, but I always like to come in and just kind of trim this flush just so it sits on the water a little better. And there you go. That's pint caddis. This is a size 16. Now it is an extended body, so it's a little bigger than a 16, um, but it's a great fly. It sits on the water great. It, it's never one of those that's gonna roll over because you've got these split wings, so it kind of acts as stabilizers, just really sits on the water nice, catches a lot of good fish. Got to try one out. All right, there it was, Smitherman's Pint Caddis. That's a cool new fly. I look forward to getting a chance to tie that one and fish it. Uh, all right, while we were tying, we had a few good questions sneak through. Uh, let's see here. Where do they start? There we go. You mentioned mashing the barb so the dropper would not slip off the hook. In what situations do you tie to the bend, and what situations do you tie a tag? This is a great question. Uh, so I mostly tie to a tag if I'm really uh, focusing more on fishing the dry. The Having a dry fly tied to a tag without, so think of it this way, if you have line tied, if my hand here is the hook, and you have line tied to the eye of the hook and line tied to the bend of the hook, so you have line coming off both sides, the fish can't come from the front or from the back and get the fly because they run into your tippet. They have to come immediately from the side, otherwise it's hard for them to get it in. So ideally you only have one tie-in point. So to make it so that the fish have maximum access to your fly, I prefer just one tie-in point. So that's when I would fish it on a dropper. Uh, the, I would fish the dry fly on a tag-in, let's call it, or a dropper off the main line. Um, if I'm mostly fishing the dry fly as, let's say, a strike indicator, uh, that I'm mostly fishing the nymph below it, then sometimes I favor putting the dry fly on, or sorry, tying the dropper onto the bend of the hook of the dry fly. Uh, Again, there's no hard, fast rules here. You can do it however you like. I just find for most of the fishing for me, when I'm fishing in relatively close and pocket water and things like that where I get a lot of eats on the dry, I tend to fish it on the tag in on the dropper system. And when I'm fishing a large river, casting a long way away and supporting a nymph for a long distance, I tend to tie more to the bend of the hook. Um, so play with that, see if it works for you. Uh, another question, Lance, when dry fly fishing, do you change flies often? I certainly do if I'm not catching fish. 
Uh, but I, I'm, I, you know, I guess it depends on what's going on. I'm fairly confident most of the time in the flies that I have that I'm offering the fish. So if I'm in a hatch, uh, it's usually for me, it's more important to change my presentation, make sure I'm getting a drag free drift, make sure I'm not spooking the fish, obviously, uh, sometimes changing my stream position to allow a better drift, a better presentation. And if those things still don't work, then I'll start changing flies. Uh, if I'm not catching fish, if I'm just covering water and not catching fish in places where I think I should, then I'll start changing flies. Um, but I don't change them as often as probably, uh, I guess, some people would think. Uh, I, I, I'm a big proponent of fly presentation trumps fly pattern. So I'm a believer that, you know, you should be able to catch fish on most good flies if they're presented properly. Um, let's see, what other good questions did we have? Um, what is CDC? This is a really good question. I apologize. We sometimes in fly fishing circles forget that not everybody knows all the jargon. Uh, so my apologies for that one. I just talk about it like everybody knows what it is. CDC stands for Col de Canard. It's, uh, I think it's French for butt of duck. It's basically feathers on the duck that surround the gland that secretes oil that makes a duck's feather wa feathers waterproof. So CDC feathers, just a feather from a duck, CDC feathers are naturally buoyant because they have that, that oil on there. They're naturally water resistant, water repellent, if you will. So CDC patterns are really popular for dry flies, uh, certainly gaining in popularity the last, well, I guess really the last 30 years or so. Um, CDC, what is it? Great question. Extended bodies, do they matter? Well, that's a personal, that's a good question. For that. It's a personal uh, answer there. I don't know that I could tell you concretely that they do or do not matter. Um, as luck would have it, our next fly is going to be an extended body. So what a timely question. You nailed it. Uh, and Phil can talk us, talk us through why he thinks uh, they do matter in some cases. I'm sure he doesn't fish 100% uh, extended bodies, but I think that they can. On some insects that have really long bodies, an extended body makes a lot of sense. In some cases, they don't. Um, well, I think we'll talk more about that one with this next fly. Can you talk tippet size as to a way to change presentation? Um, yeah, a little bit. I mean, tippet size, think of tippet as not, to me, tippet is not a matter of clarity. It's not a matter of the fish seeing 6x but not seeing 7x. To me, it's more a matter of having the limpness of the 7x. Thinner material is softer and, and drifts more naturally. So the smaller the fly you're fishing, the more it's influenced by thicker tippet. So if you're fishing a size 20 fly, you can get 5x tippet right through the eye of a size 20 hook, no problem but it's not gonna drift very well because the tippet's a little bit too thick for that size of fly. That's not to say you won't catch any fish on 5X in a size 20, I have lots of times, but you'll generally speaking get a better drift, a better presentation by going thinner tippet on a fly that size. On the flip side, if you're trying to throw a 5X tippet with a size you know, six hopper, you're gonna have a heck of a time casting it. The stiffness of the tippet is not there. It doesn't have enough power to kick everything over. So you're going to have a lot better accuracy and control, which are much more important. You know, putting a hopper tight to a bank under control is much more important than fishing with thin tippet. Um, so those are some examples of, I would say, is, is using tippet sizes to change your presentation. Um, how do you overcome complex surface currents to get a good presentation? That is the end all be all question. Uh, that's a tough one to answer over the internet, but generally speaking, you're changing your stream position. You move to... Allow yourself to get the best presentation possible with the least amount of conflicting currents between your position and the fish. Uh, when that's not working, you extend your tippet. Longer tippet has more slack. Ideally, when that's happening, you want a leader that doesn't turn over nice and straight. You want a leader that turns over and actually piles a little bit because that piling tippet buys you drag-free drift. So the, the best dry fly fishers I've seen, speaking specifically of small dry flies, small imitative hatch matching type patterns, the best dry fly fishers I know fish incredibly long tippets, um, five, six, seven feet sometimes of tippet. Uh, that's like straight 6x, 7x, 8x tippet. They do that on purpose because they don't want the leader to turn over straight. When the leader turns over straight, as soon as it lands, it immediately gets dragged. When you can build slack into that system, you get a better drag-free drift. Um, otherwise, again, stream positioning, moving around, uh, will help eliminate some of that casting techniques like uh, reach casts like uh, snake casts or, or serpent uh, slack you add into the cast can all help give you a little more uh, slack in the presentation and therefore a better drag free drift 
Should the dropper tag be longer for a dry fly compared to a nymph? Um, maybe a little, yeah, but it doesn't need to be really long. I tend to fish them like five or six inches most of the time to the dry. It's just important that it's long enough that the fish can get around it and not be uh, running into the other piece of line. Does the dying process compromise CDC's buoyancy? You know, I've always wondered that same question, and I honestly don't know the real answer here. I think it has to to some degree because it's got to remove some of those oils. But there's something still about the little barbules on a CDC feather that still have buoyancy. Certainly, I've used dyed products that have natural buoyancy built into them. Whether or not it, they're compromised a bit because they're dyed, I couldn't really answer for you. Uh, they still work for me. I don't think that it's compromising them to the point that you can't fish a dyed feather. That said, I do favor a, a natural uh, feather and you know natural color if I can get it. But some flies, you know, like another fly of mine that's corn fed, they Umpwa does one called the corn fed Sally. The corn fed Sally is uh, because it's a yellow Sally. It's yellow, uses yellow CDC. Um, so you know you're not going to get a naturally occurring yellow duck. So you got to have some dye on there. Uh, great questions though, and a couple things that I forgot to mention. Uh, on, uh, let's see, on the missing link from Mike Mercer, I didn't mention how many colors it has. It's available in green drake, olive red, yellow, PMD, Sally, and then in some caddis colors, one they call caddis dark and caddis amber. Most of them are available in size 12 to 18, 12 to 20 on, uh, I think just the olive goes to a 20. So lots of options there. And also, I mentioned there were lots of colors of the stubby chubby. I actually don't know exactly how many there are, but there are a bunch. I would guess there are probably six or eight colors of the stubby chubby too. So lots of good options there. All right, so as one of those questions came in that was perfect and timely about uh, extended bodies, let's learn about our next fly. Our, our final video here of the night is Phil Awani's Awani Dunn. Um, Awani, Phil, I got a chance to chat with Phil both via uh, phone and just you know messaging. And Phil had some cool thoughts about his fly. Um, first and foremost, he wanted to stress that he designed this fly for picky tailwater fish, uh, which I think is important to point out. This is not your, you know, this is not the same as a stubby chubby. So one of the questions earlier was talking about how you decide what to use. This is not something you're just throwing, you know, to cover water. This is a fly designed to target rising fish in hatching conditions. Um, it's also available in hatch matching colors. So um, when I was chatting with Phil, he brought up a really good point, I thought. He said, people ask me what I am thinking about when I design a new fly. And to be honest, it's quite simple. I want to catch those hard-to-catch fish. So that's a really cool thing to say. It's really basic, but kind of profound at the same time. Sometimes we're designing flies for specific situations, specific hatches, that sort of thing. And that's, it sounded to me like that's exactly what Phil is doing with this fly. Um, Phil Zawani Dunn uses uh, the, an awesome hook. It's Tiemco's 2488. It's uh, a very versatile hook. It's usable on nymphs, on dries. You can tie zebra midges on it, scuds on it. You can also tie dry flies like, like Phil will demonstrate for us here in a second. It's just strong enough wire that it lands most large fish. Um, if you get a really, really big fish, you know, you're fishing a, a lake or a river that has grows really, really large fish, you might even get the 2488H, um, sorry, the 88H is the heavy wire versus the regular 2488. Um, but this, this is a really versatile hook that you ought to check out if you're not using it already. Um, as Phil describes it, the Iwani Dunn was born from the logical desire to create a more realistic mayfly dry that caught more fish. He went on to say, I brought some blueing olive mayflies home one day after fishing a hatch and looked at them through a magnifying glass. I noticed that they had two small tails, a shiny extended body that had a slight upward curve to it, and I looked at the standard blueing olive pattern that I had fished, and it didn't look anything like the naturals. I worked on my Iwana Dunn pattern, extended body mayfly, for about a month and got it to the point that I thought it would fish really well. I went back to Cheeseman Canyon and fished the blueing olive hatch again, and this time I had amazing results. So let's check out this cool video of Phil's Awani Dunn, this is more of a hatch matching fly. I think you'll really like this one. It has a cool extended body. And then we'll uh, get back to a few more of your questions. I'll be tying my Iwani Dunn extended body parachute mayfly. And uh, this was born in the Cheeseman Canyon, which is a South Platte River system. And 
um, I was fishing the standard mayfly patterns, and the, the fish were either uh, taking it or rejecting it, but it almost always seemed like they were backing down. And my drift is, my presentation is as close to perfect as I can get it, because I know if you drag, it doesn't matter what fly you're using, they're not going to take it. So um, I wanted to make a fly that was very close to the natural. And when I looked at it, I sampled the fly. I took some home and actually put it under a high-powered magnifying glass and noticed that uh, what, what it, how it differed from the, the standard pattern. One, it was I noticed that the, the actual abdomen was shiny and that the, the actual tails were just two. And I said, wow, they're using, you know, four, five, six fibers from a hackle for the tail. And of course, the body or the abdomen was always dubbed. So it didn't have a shine to it. So that's what I was trying to do. So when I was looking around, I needed to find a, a, a hook that would allow me to extend the body beyond the shank of the hook. And I wanted to actually have a hook that had a larger gape because I noticed the smaller, of course, you went with your, your hooks, which standard would be maybe like a TMC 100 or 101 hook. I noticed as it got smaller, of course, the gape got smaller and you get less hookups. And even when you hooked them up, sometimes they would come off because you didn't get much of a bite with that particular hook. So the TMC 2488 was the perfect hook for me. It, it, it was like it was designed for this particular fly. So that's the one I selected and it works so good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be tying a, a PMD extended body and I'm going to be using Vivas 14 knot bread in yellow. And make sure that you have a good size um, tag end. And just take this down to the bend of the hook. And then you want to capture the tag end of this of this tag end. I'm going to use this to split the um, the tail. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to tie the extended body and I'm just using standard, I mean standard uh, monofilament and this particular fly, because it's a larger fly, I'm going to be using 17 pound monofilament. I'm just going to cut it. When I first designed this fly, I would tie this on and it would actually roll on me because the monofilament, of course, is round and the shank of the hook is round. So I want, I said, well, it keeps rolling on me. So what, what can I do to make it not roll? So I found that if I took a pair of hemostats, I could crimp it down and I want to crimp it down so it's half the length of the straight part of the shank of the hook. So I'm just going to take this and just crimp it down. And now I'm going to be tying flat material to round material, and it stays. For me, I for this particular fly, I'm I'm going to be spinning my my bobbin counterclockwise, so I don't have to fight the thread. And I'm going to lash this in. Make sure that it's on the top of the shank of the hook. And this this Vivas thread is so strong you can, I mean, you can put a lot of pressure on it without breaking the thread. And then just tie it off. So the monofilament has a, a memory and a natural mayfly has a little uh, curve upward and, and it just worked out perfect for me. So at this point in time, I'm gonna flip the fly Don't have the shakes. There we go. And right now, this, um, of course, the monofilament is way too long. And when when people say they're taking a size 16 PMD, what does that mean? Well, if you just go to the fly shop, you're going to buy a size 16. But if you're tying your flies, it means something. So where do I cut my monofilament to make it a size 16. When you're fly fishing, the size is the most important thing. The second variable that's important is the shape and then the color. So I want to make sure 
that this 16 is tr this a uh, 16 extended body is truly a 16. So what I'm going to be doing is this is a TMC uh, uh, 101, and I want to make sure when I cut this, it's the length of the shank of this 101 hook. When you've done it enough, you don't even have to do this anymore, but initially you want to do this because the size is, gonna, is critical. If the size is too large, they're not going to take the fly. I'm going to take just crazy glue or super glue or zap a gap, whatever you have, and I'm going to cover the monofilament with it. I'm going to take this tag in and put it underneath this monofilament. You have to do this. You have to you have to spin your bobbin, or you're going to be fighting this thread the whole time, and it'll be almost impossible to do this. So what I'm going to do is cover this monofilament with the thread. So if I was tying a blowing olive, for instance, I'd just be using olive thread. So I'm just going to cover this monofilament with this thread. And this crazy glue or super glue or zappa gap or whatever you're using cut, keeps this thing from slipping off. And by spinning the bobbin, you know, I'm, I'm actually palmering this up and down, even though it looks like I'm pulling it towards me. I'm not. I'll be taking microfibits, tailing material. And I'm going to take two of these off because the actual mayfly has either two or three tails. It doesn't have five or six. And I, again, I was trying to make this uh, as close to the natural as possible. So I'm going to take two of these, make sure they line up. And I'm just going to cut the tips off a little bit. And the reason I do that is Sometimes when you leave it in the fly box too long, the, the microfib, it's kind of, kind of uh, curl, and then it just don't, I don't think it mat matters to the trout, but it kind of matters to me. So you're going to tie these in and make sure that this is on the top of the, on top of the monofilament. And don't worry about the length of it because I can make that adjustment later. Go all the way to the end of the monofilament and then go back to the bend of the hook. Okay, and then the tail should be the length of the fly itself. So all you do is you take the tag in and you just pull it towards the eye of the hook until it's the right length. And that's it. Then I'm going to take this tag in, I'm going to put it through the middle of these tails and tie it in. Again, going back to the end of the extended body and go back. Tie it off. And then you can just kind of play with this a little bit. It's a, a very forgiving fly to tie. Cut off the tag ends. I got a little fuzz there. So the actual mayfly has a shiny or a sheen to its extended body, the actual abdomen. So I'm just going to use UV resin and coat it. whole extended body. Hit it with the UV light. And that's the extended body. Let me get rid of that little fiber here that's bothering me. 
and then we're going to flip this fly. I'm going to be tying the parachute part now. It's going to wrap this end here. And I'm going to leave the thread right in front of that monofilament. I'm going to be tying my post in now. which I'm using as, I use my fly-on for the post. I find that the, the uh, actual post doesn't uh, get flattened out over time. It keeps its form. Like so. And because I'm going to, you'll see that I'm going to be doubling this up, I'm not going to be, um, I'm not going to have to use the whole, all of this material. So I'm just going to take this and cut oh, maybe about an inch or so. And then I'm just going to get rid of some of this material. I don't need that much. Okay, I'm going to position this right at the end of the monofilament. Lay it across the top. Again, I'm just going to just, because that's what I do, I'm going to spin my bobbin, put a couple of loose wraps over it, make sure it's positioned correctly, if it, I can move it by lifting it. And once it's in place, I'm just going to put tight wraps on top of each other. I'm not spreading this out, I'm trying to keep it right on top of each other. Then I'm going to hold this up, and I'm just going to palmer up the up the post. So what I'm doing is I'm just advancing it with my finger going upwards and then back down. I'm going to take the thread and go back to the bend of the hook and I'm just going to be using PMD dubbing I'm going to dub this before I put in the hackle because the hackle gets in the way when I'm trying to put the dubbing in. And again, you want to stretch out your dubbing, like stretch it out like this, and so it doesn't clump up. So I just kind of stretch it out a little bit like this and extend it. And then just put it on your thread. And you don't need wax, it'll, it'll stay. And then I'm going to build the thorax now. If you want to tighten it up, you can spin it while you're dubbing. Now I'm going to be introducing the uh, tying in the dubbing. So I'm just using that. To, 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 to prepare the um, the hackle, all you have to do is strip off some of the fibers because you're going to tie that into the onto the shank of the hook. And that you there's a concave and a convex side of this. You want to tie the concave side against the post. If you do that, then when you tie the, when you palmer it, the actual hackle is going to be, the um, concave side is facing upwards, which is the way I like it. I have friends that like to tie it where the, the concave side is is um, pointing downward. And, and I'm thinking, and they say, well, it's like a rowboat that actually uh, capsizes and, and uh, it, it holds air. And I said, well, well, why do they make a rowboat that is supposed to be upright? And I said, you know what? It's actually a personal preference. It doesn't matter. But I, I, they sometimes say it sinks the fly when if it's uh, concave side facing upwards. That, but I said, you know what? <clears throat> the only reason it's going to sink is because you're dragging it. So anyway, now I'm going to dub the thorax again. And 
this particular way of doing your uh, your um, posts and, and how you doing a parachute. This is to me is the easiest method of, of tying a parachute. I mean, I've tried other ways. I mean, I love to tie, but I don't like to tie unnecessarily and I don't want it to take any longer or be any harder to tie than necessary. So if you take about four or five <laughs> wraps, if it's a smaller fly, you're not gonna do as many wraps because it's gonna, you're gonna over hackle it. So I'm gonna take two wraps over this tag end of the saddle and two above and one below. So I'm gonna, and actually I'm above the, the uh, shank itself. And if you don't do this, sometimes, I mean, even, I mean, uh, the hackle will unravel off the post. So what I do is I just hold the post and I tug on the hackle just to get it real tight. And then I'll just cut that. So when I when I'm tying um, when I'm tying a um, um, a parachute, I don't try to tie the end of the hackle to the front of the hook. It's just too hard. It's always you always trap fibers and things like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie this around the actual post, and I'm above I'm above the the the, the hook. And because this is 14 knot and the diameter is so small, I'm just going to tie this in a couple of times. That way I don't have to use glue. Glue always gets over on everything and just makes a mess. So I'm just gonna tie this a few times. This will never come unraveled. I mean, you can catch so many fish with just one. And then just cut this. And then just neaten it up a little bit. And then just cut this to the right size, which is about oh, a gape and a half of the hook. And that's it right there. My extended body, my Iwani then extended body mayfly. And you can tie this in any any in any uh, size in any pattern. Uh, you can do this in a blue ring olive. You can get a, do a tie it in a size 10 green drake. You can tie this in a size 26 for a trico. Uh, the technique is the same. The monofilament changes in size, of course. The, the smaller the fly, the smaller the test of the monofilament. But this is this is dynamite. I mean, uh, if there's a if there's a um, mayfly hatch, it, this is this for me anyway. This fly works tremendously. All right, that was a cool fly. Thanks, Phil, for sharing that with us. I like the extended body, very out-of-the-box style of fly with the monofilament core. That's beautiful. And uh, it's worth mentioning, he just tied it in kind of a PMD color, but you could do it in blueing olive, uh, green drake, trico. There's all kinds of, you could do them in olive yellow, you know, Adam's color, black, anything you want to match your local mayflies. All right, while he was tying, we had a few more questions before we wrap up. <clears throat> Let's see if I can get to the top of them here. Um, all right, I think the first one is, yep, okay. First one is, on a dry dropper, do you like it with a dropper tag or in line with a nymph? And again, I mentioned this in a little bit earlier, but I'll hit it one more time. There is no right answer there. On a dry dropper, I like uh, both, depending on the situation. Uh, when I'm fishing really close range, I tend to fish it more on a tag. When I'm fishing much farther away, I tend to fish it more tied to the bend. Um, if I were generalizing, I probably spend 90% of the time with my dry dropper with the dry on a tag and 10% of the time tied to the bend of the hook. Um, next question, is the monofilament buoyant? So speaking of Phil's Iwani down there, is it... Uh, is the mono buoyant. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know exactly which monofilament he used, but generally speaking, mono has a tiny bit of buoyancy. There are some monofilaments that have some buoyancy built into them. 
I don't think that that's where that fly is getting most of its buoyancy. I think most of it's going to come from the dubbing that'll trap air, the poly wing, and the hackle, most, first and foremost, uh, should make that fly float pretty well. I think it's designed to be, where you're, you know, the fish are mostly going to see the thorax or the dubbed part of it, the legs or the parachute hackle, and then a little bit imprint of that uh, upswept body is going to make a little imprint on the, on the surface of the water. Um, what else? What else? What else? Um, any tips for tying such small flies? Yeah, there's some good tips for tying small flies. First and foremost, use thin thread. The thinnest you can stand. Uh, not all thin threads are created equal. You may have to play with some brands to see which one works well for you. But uh, thin thread has less bulk and therefore uh, doesn't bulk up your tiny flies as much. Second, uh, minimize your thread wraps. Most people really over tie everything in. You know, for most materials, it doesn't take 15 or 20 wraps of thread to hold in a hackle stem. It usually takes three, maybe five wraps of thread under proper tension to just hold it in place. So minimize those thread wraps. Again, minimizing bulk, uh, which is kind of the most common problem with really small flies. After that, if you're adding dubbing, uh, dubbing, the rule of thumb there is always less is more. Uh, when we watch people tie flies, when they, they bring in a, their vice and say, I'm struggling with this pattern, I can't get the dubbing to work, inevitably they're using a, not just a little bit too much, like way too much dubbing. Usually I recommend if whatever you think you need to use, cut that in like one-fourth and try that amount of dubbing, uh, especially on small flies. Overdubbing is a bad thing. You don't want to do it. Otherwise, let's see, any other questions? I don't think we have a lot of other questions. Um, what's up with the rooster? It says you mentioned on Instagram all oh, the rooster. Let's see if I can change the angle of this. You can see it. That's Bob. I'm at the shop right now, Five Fish Food, and Bob is one of our uh, roosters. He's dressed up a bit. Uh, I don't know what's up with it. He's just a cool. Well, he's actually a whiting hackle bird, so he's one of them. The the birds we have on display here in the shop. Out of frame, there's another one over here. We have another uh, rooster downstairs we call Matthew. Anyway, that's up, what's up with the rooster. Uh, it was more of a tease, nothing really serious there. All right, so we're about ready to wrap up. I appreciate all of you tuning in. Thanks for all the great comments. Thanks for all the great questions. Um, before we go, a couple of, of uh, business items here. So next week, December 16th, uh, we have junk flies on tap. So that'll be a fun one. I'm, get, I'm guessing, I don't know what's in that one, but I'm guessing that somebody's going to probably tie a moth. Somebody's probably going to tie an egg. Somebody's going to probably tie a worm imitation. I know I have a fly in there, but I won't tell you what it is. I don't think it's a junk fly because um, I don't believe in junk flies. But that's what the uh, powers that be at UMCO wanted to call that series, that session. So we have junk flies on tap next week. Should be a fun one. Um, also of note, all of these videos are going to be posted on the YouTube channel of UMCO. So if you missed any part of this or you want to go back and reference parts of it, they'll be available on YouTube. Uh, on that note, don't forget to like and subscribe. You can click the button right now. Like, give it a thumbs up. Uh, or if you didn't like it, give it a thumbs down. We don't care. It gives us feedback either way. Actually, thumbs down gives us the same amount of positive energy as thumbs up. So mash one of those, preferably thumbs up, and uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, one more shout out to Trout Unlimited for their support uh, and promotion of these videos. Thanks to all you folks at TU. Thanks for all the great things you do. And to my fellow fly fishers out there, if you're not already a member, I encourage you to become a Trout Unlimited member. Otherwise, on behalf of all the tires, uh, I want to thank you for your time. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, thanks for all the great questions and comments. And uh, I wish you happy angling. Have fun out there. Be safe.